Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'm really looking forward to the dialogues that we're having in the roundtables as well to get your feedback and, uh, and your take on this whole emerging important issue. So thanks again. It's a little different to be speaking to this rather formal group. My classes tend to be rather intimate. <laughs> uh, 35 sitting around a table as close as we can get so we can really see each other. But uh, hopefully you don't feel uh, distanced by this beautiful setting. So um, my presentation, uh, my part of the presentation is to talk about the cyberbullying against a faculty, which includes um, sort of professors, uh, teaching assistants and tutor markers, other teaching personnel, limited term uh, professors and so on, and cyberbullying by both uh, students and faculty members, or colleagues in other words. Um, this is an interesting topic for me because uh, of course I have been cyberbullied, why else would I not want to do this kind of research? Uh, I think a number of us who, who are in a teaching role have experienced cyberbullying and, and workplace bullying by colleagues. So um, it's not only a personal interest uh, to find out what's going on in the wider spectrum, but also to look at how can we, um, how can we change the culture, as uh, Chantal and Terry have already talked about, to make it a kinder uh, world, a kinder workplace and a kinder world and kinder exchanges. Oops, I've already moved on to the second slide, but what I'm going to be focusing on here in the limited time that I have is uh, really just give you a bit of a picture of the extent of the cyberbullying, uh, some of the targets, who are the perpetrators, the means, the impact, and what did the faculty members uh, pose uh, for solutions. So like, um, um, anyway, I'll, I'll just move on. So I've had to limit, obviously, we've got this huge data set, where do we begin to share? But just to give you a bit of a picture of some of the findings uh, that we're learning, and the findings are still coming in, particularly at University um, D and C. So this gives you a bit of a background of who our participants were. They replied uh, in an online survey, and then we did interview um, some professors as well. So uh, you'll see that um, to date we had 269 responses completed the survey across all four universities and the data from DNC are still coming in. You'll also see that most of the respondents were professors in permanent positions, although at University A, and University A is in BC by the way, uh, most were sessionals, limited term faculty, tutor markers, and TAs. And I'll come back to this a little bit later because I think it's important to our data. The category of other refers to permanent lecturers, student advisors, academic advisors, and you'll see again that this category is highest with University A. As with the student surveys, far more females than males participated in the survey, and depending on the university, from 63% to 73% were females, and most spoke English as their first language. The very last part of the slide has to do with how concerned uh, respondents were with the problem of cyberbullying on their campus, and three quarters across the board were either extremely concerned or somewhat concerned. So the top two categories of um, a five-point scale. So it shows that they were pr pretty concerned with the, with the issue themselves, even though not, not all of them had been cyberbullied themselves. This bar graph gives you a sense of the extent to which faculty members were cyberbullied by students and by colleagues at the four universities in the last 12 months. So fac uh, faculty at University B, also in British Columbia, experienced the most cyberbullying by both students and colleagues, 32% by students and 18% by colleagues. Um, we're still unpacking the data to try to figure out why this is. In fact, faculty members were more likely to be cyberbullied by students at the two British Columbia universities than the other two universities. So if you look at that purple um, bar graph at A and B, there's more likelihood of cyberbullying there at the two universities in BC. 
University C in the east had a reverse pattern with more cyberbullying by colleagues, 14% by colleagues and 10% by students, and University D, the data is still coming in, but the pattern is similar to University C. This is a prairie university, although fewer incidences overall, 12% by colleagues and 5% by students. So we still have to analyze why, for example, um, University B has more incidents and why there's more incidents of cyberbullying students to faculty in British Columbia. Another um, observation, we note the extent of cyberbullying reported that faculty members have experienced does not match the figures that um, Chantal talked about. So if you look at the student data, only 2% of students in University A admitted to cyberbullying faculty, 3% at University B, and 1% at University C. So either those who cyberbullied faculty did not complete our survey, so they completed their own survey, or those who, uh, those who did were not honest about their results. So moving on, the question, what, who, and why? You'll see that the most common means for cyberbullying uh, faculty is by, uh, by students is email first, and then through Rate My Professor sites like Rate My Professor. And, uh, and then the cyberbullying by colleagues, so colleague to colleague, is almost entirely by email. And this is interesting to me because with email, of course, the person's name is attached to the email. So the sender uh, gives the name and then proceeds to make all of these comments um, and seemingly unconcerned about the repercussions. The messages noted uh, the most common sort of um, feeling of the messages that the faculty reported is at the bottom there. So insulting, demanding, and or demeaning. And I'll give a few examples in the next couple of slides. So you'll note that teaching-related and work-related reasons, or the victim's role or position, were the most common reason given for being cyberbullied. So it was work-related. It wasn't necessarily personal or sexual. In that sense. It could be sexual, but it was work-related reasons that they were being targeted. And gender and age bubbled up as also a cause for being cyberbullied by students particular at University A, and coming back to BC again, where 46% of the respondents noted gender as being a factor as to why they were cyberbullied, and 31% indicated age. And gender and age were also identified as being a cause by colleagues, particularly at University A. So if you look across, um, 20, I just haven't indicated what the statistics come from, but the 27% in both instances for gender and age, um, that was University A again. So University A noted 27% uh, that uh, gender and age was a cause for cyberbullying. So this might come back to my earlier slide, just speculating here, the large number of non-professors in temporary positions in the sample at University A. So here's just a couple of examples I, I wanted to read out. Um, these are, this is examples of cyberbullying by students, and I come through a lot. Like we leave, left an open-ended response item for people to write, and almost everyone wrote something. So here's a couple of examples. In a course chat room, a student made comments identifying me as a bitch and marking too hard with high expectations. Another comment. Defamation of character and rate my professor, insulting and lied about me, I did not really feel good about going to that class knowing that someone was hating me. It was pretty depressing and unmotivating. Another one, email, text messages, making comments that I was incompetent, not accessible, too slow, workload too difficult, and the words used were useless, lousy, and I am reporting you. Student was not open to feedback. I felt attacked, humiliated. Fourth one, the student didn't like my policies and she continually wrote emails implying I was stupid and put them in capitals, sometimes copying the president's office. I'm still unable to stop it. And a couple of examples of cyberbullying um, by colleagues. By the way, uh, just in terms of cyberbullying by students, 
depending on the university. So be between either 56% at one university and 100% at another university, our faculty said they tried to stop the cyberbullying from students with 0% to 60% saying it worked. So not very effective at making it stop. This next slide is a couple of examples of cyberbullying by colleagues. I was bullied by a fellow instructor who made an error, and when I followed up, it angered her. I was extremely upset in the escalation that occurred, which eventually included a few nasty, harassing, and insulting emails. Another example. A group of faculty did not like the a process for doing a particular task, and four of them wrote emails indicating I didn't know what I was doing, yelling in emails, extreme rudeness, saying they would go to the president. Pre Why does everyone want to go to the president? <laughs> if, if I didn't do what they wanted, stressful. They eventually gave up and stopped on their own after one year when I did not give in to their rudeness. So this person experienced it for one year. Third quote, I was sent lots of text messages from an individual, a colleague, who believed I had been gossiping about her. She was threatening and told me to fix the problem I had caused. She texted me 73 times in one day, and over a week it was about 180 messages. When I didn't respond, it was worse. So what we found uh, for those who had been cyberbullied, we asked them who they turned to for help. And faculty members were more likely to turn to a friend, a partner, or colleague, similar to what with books and so No, I'm just commenting on this. I don't have a slide. <laughs> um, a, a part, partner for help. Few, I was told I could only have 10 slides, so <laughs> that's why. So few told an administrator, um, few, only few told an administrator, the human rights officer or complaints office, their faculty association or union or somebody in charge. And most tried to stop the cyberbullying, but less than half were successful. And for those administrators here, among those who did tell an administrator, fewer than one third of these respondents said it helped. Now I can move on. Okay. So what this slide is, it looks at gender issues uh, with faculty. So picking up on Chantel's uh, focus on gender in, in her part of her presentation. So this looks in terms of gender, in terms of who was cyberbullied by students and colleagues. So which faculty member in terms of gender. And you'll see just across the slide there, I don't have the pointer, but women are the most, most often the targets by both students and colleagues except University B, where students are targeted um, by, but where students target male faculty more often than females. All right, so that little purple thing up there on, on, um, on University B. But let's take a look at University A. So B is in British Columbia and so is A. A. Females were targeted by students more than twice as often as males, and only females were targeted by colleagues. So no male faculty member was targeted by another colleague at University A, only females. In University C, only females were targeted by students, and almost twice as many females as males were targeted by colleagues. So University B is the anomaly here. Here, more faculty, male faculty members were targeted by students, but if you look across, more females were targeted by colleagues which is consistent with the other universities. So just a couple more in, in, pieces of information about this university, A and B, C. So remember, most of the faculty members that completed the survey did not have permanent positions and were non-professors. That could have something to do with it. So the power and control theory that Dr. Fauché mentioned could come into play here. Who has the power? If you have less power, you have a non-permanent non position, you're younger. Uh, your age is younger, you might be more vulnerable. So this isn't on the slide either. So which colleagues were doing the cyberbullying in University A? So faculty all said they were targeted by somebody they knew. Okay? So they all knew who the perpetrator was. 
Now, I could ask you the question, do you think they were more cyberbullied by female colleagues or by male colleagues? Okay, let's have a hands, okay? How many think they were cyberbullied more so by female colleagues? Doesn't matter, it's me. Okay? How many thought it's more by male colleagues? All right, how many think uh, half and half? All right, okay. Actually, you're, you're quite right in terms of the show of hands. So more uh, colleagues, so it's only female we're looking at. More women, females targeted the women faculty members. So of those women who had experienced uh, target, uh, targeted by um, cyberbullying by colleagues, 45% were targeted by other females, 36% by males, and 18% by both. So there's some gender issues going on here. Um, and overall, if you look at this slide, more women were the targets than men, and, but also more women were doing the cyberbullying of colleagues, particularly at University A. We still have to go through all the data at the other universities. Okay, I'll quickly go through this one. I just wanted to give you a sense of the impact. So, I know Lyda here, my wonderful colleague, um, I just finished a doctorate working in this area at, her, at another institution in British Columbia. She, she has talked a lot about this in her own dissertation. But I'll just quickly go through, we, we had a long checklist of what um, faculty members could check off in terms of the impact. I was shocked when I saw this slide. You know, the proportion that felt fear for safety, uh, ability to do their work, felt like quitting, affected their relationships at university, affected their mental health, um, affected their relationship outside the university, affected their physical health. Some even felt suicidal. So 20% at University um, B and D, following being cyberbullied by colleagues, felt suicidal. And then a lot of them wanted to cyberbully back. And this is also the cycle that goes on with cyberbullying. If you're bullied, you feel like striking out. So it's obvious that there are serious impacts to being cyberbullied by both students and colleagues, including some victims who thought about self-harm. So this is affecting our workplace. So students are being impacted, as Dr. Fouché talked about, um, within the, the culture of the university community. But, but people who come here to work are also being targeted. Hopefully my time's okay, Terry. Uh, top three solutions posed. Uh, Chantel mentioned five, I've got three here. Um, you'll see there's really a, a lot of commonality. So the top one then is um, both groups recommended um, developing a strong anti-bullying policy and also providing counseling and support services to victims. Now faculties number two was developing a more respectful university culture where kind behavior is modeled by all. And this was number four on the students list. So this is a, another top recommendation. And in terms of policy, faculty stated in a separate set of responses to questions that they were generally unaware of whether there were some, any cyberbullying policies at their university at all, and if there were some, whether they were clear. So there were, if there were some, what was the communication? And many also did not know if the policies were enforced or whether they were effective. effective. So there's a whole sort of a morass here on policy that needs to um, take place in terms of developing strong policy, communicating it, making it effective, and so on. I'd also like to look at that one, develop a more university, uh, respectful university culture where kind behavior is modeled by all. And uh, Dr. Magison alluded to, mentioned this in his introductions. This is also why I think I'm involved in cyberbullying. I, I want to move us to that other way, where that other side of the coin where we're, where we're, where we're more respectful and kinder to one another, where where we're connecting, where we're understanding, where we're empathetic. It's a huge task. It's a, it's a, I mean, we'll be doing it for a thousand years, I'm sure. But we need to work towards this. We need to start thinking about it and not just, not just develop policies, not just have counseling services, but set up a dialogue and in the wider culture as well 
let's stop all this bullying and, and let's really start to engage in a different sort of way. 57% um, by the way in a separate set of question of faculty said they would like to help, uh, help, like to help create a more kinder and respectful online world. Maybe we should have dialogues about this within the university environment, within courses. Uh, setting up mini workshops. We'd like to continue with this, as Terry pointed out, and move it into some new directions and keep in touch. All right. This is my final slide. Um, there, just because we're academics, we have to situate this within some relevant theory, like trying to understand what really is going on, I think it's important. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through each of these with my timing here. And so what theory can help, help us understand cyberbullying of faculty? So there, very little research has been done to date on this phenomenon, by the way. There's only a couple of studies um, that look at cyberbullying by students towards faculty. This is internationally. And I don't think we've found anything to date. Uh, I guess slightest. <laughs> Um, a LIDA study that looks at cyberbullying among, among colleagues. Although yours is mainly um, student to student, uh, student to faculty, I think, as well, LIDA. So um, the academic entitlement literature offers some explanation for cyberbullying by students. So this literature um, documents the expectation that some students have for high reward with little effort an expectation of special consideration, and then anger when expectations aren't met. So then there's the lashing out. And this literature is linked with student incivility. So that would be intentional behavior designed to disrupt and interfere with the teaching process and the learning process of others, which may include harass harassing um, the instructor. And then student incivility towards faculty members is actually a form of what's called a contra power harassment. So where a person with supposedly more power, that is the faculty member, is bullied by a person with less power, presumably the student, but there's a power imbalance because um, the student can take a lot of power and rate my professor sites and student evaluations and other sorts of means. And generally, this research shed, uh, indicates that younger faculty members and females and those with lower status are most at risk for contra power harassment. And Dr. Fouché talked earlier about the power and control model. This is also important to understand um, because this can be applied against faculty members as well. It's a characteristic of bullying behavior. So the bully always wants to maintain some control or power over the other. And in the online world, this can take different forms, as you know. Um, and status, role, authority, gender, age, ethnicity are all factors relating to the degree of power that somebody holds or somebody wields uh, against an individual. And on statement being, statements made online and shared with others can repeatedly bully and give the perpetrator power. And there's also the power, of course, of student evaluations and all of these different things. And also the power wielded by different faculty members in different um, administrative roles of authority over others where power can be wielded. So, and just the gender issues quickly, because uh, I'm recognizing my time here. So just as with the student finders, gender issues are important to understanding cyberbullying against faculty. So women are more likely to be targeted by students and by colleagues. And this does include women in both permanent and non-permanent positions. I just mainly focused on uh, University A, but it's across the board. And women responded in greater number to men than to our survey, perhaps indicating a greater concern with the problem. So I think what this all tells us is that it's great that we're here. Uh, we, can, we can start the dialogue in, in bringing together all the stakeholders, including the students who are more technologically savvy than we'll ever be, unless there's some tech people here, Brian, Linda, <laughs> um, than we'll ever be around this technology. So we need to engage in this collaborative dialogue where we move forward. Um, to make the universities safer places to work and live and be students. So thank you very much.